What's up guys, Cosmic back with a little bit of a different video this time around. I'm going to be giving my top 5 movies of all time, starting from the lowest to the highest. If you want to see more videos like this, comment down below, leave a like, and show your support so I'll know you guys would like to see more of this type of ranking content. Also, wanted to give a little shout out to my new channel, collaborating with my boy Young Croc Lord. yes sir, yes sir. We'll be making skit videos from anime to Marvel and many other forms of media. So, if you want to check that out, please check the description or wait to the end of the video. Alright, no more advertising like every corporal sellout during Pride Month. Time to go on with the video. For my fifth favorite movie, I'm going to have to give this film to The Flash. Recently released, I'm going to try my best to be as spoiler free as possible, but spoilers possibly ahead. This film demonstrated what The Flash actually means and goes heavy on your emotions during the film, with Flash going back in time to change what happened to his mother with the introduction of the Flash from an alternate reality and Michael Keaton's Batman. And may I say, this team is an absolute unit to be reckoned with, as they work together really well and have nice personalities that bounce off each other very well in the film. Now, Ezra Miller, not a good person at all in the slightest, makes a phenomenal Flash actor. He exemplifies the qualities of what you expect from the Flash in comedy, resilience, determination, and overall heartbreak. Now, as a comic reader, I can say he is the Flash, and I can understand why this film is so heavily featured, loved, and adored among Flash fans. Now, moving on to Michael Keaton's Batman, I'm definitely gonna get hate for saying this, but just give me a second to explain, alright? Please. I, uh... I didn't like his Batman during his original films, I kind of found him, like, lackluster. And seeing him in the suit, the way he moved, and how funny and wonky it looked, I used to call him Stiff Batman, because I didn't see much of his potential. I prefer the Joker during those films, honestly. But in the movie, Michael Keaton was the GOAT. I'm so sorry for what I said. He really showed during this film why he is the Batman. I haven't seen a performance that well in a while, and God was I screaming and creaming in this theater like I was gonna have a fucking nerdgasm. From his personality to his fighting style, and arranging his scenes before combat and out of combat, this man exemplified what an older Batman is supposed to be and act like. From head to toe, they got everything right. All they were missing was a Robin, but who knows, maybe he's on his Jason arc and let him have a sleepover with the Joker. And for being the stiff Batman, in this movie, he even proved me wrong there, being incredibly flexible with his moves. Now, let's call him Second Flash, was the comedic relief and had a lot of heartwarming scenes that made you really feel for him, and feel I did. He was witty, annoying, comedic, and overall a struggling 18-year-old who was just trying to get through life before being taken aback by the situation that he was confronted with. I appreciate this character and what they did with him. He's honestly one of my favorite characters in the whole film alone. I understand his feelings and how he operates. I don't want to talk a lot about him to spoil much, but I recommend watching the film if you're curious. Don't listen to the fucking people that say this shit was bad just because of Ezra Miller. The bad guy of this movie really boosts up and contrasts well with the entirety of the film. Alright. But we gotta go on to the next spot. Moving on to my number four spot for my favorite movies, I have Into the Spider-Verse. I would say Across the Spider-Verse, but I gotta rewatch it. So I have a better understanding of the actual film and the quality. But Across the Spider-Verse, I'd probably prefer. But till I rewatch that movie, Into the Spider-Verse. Now this movie was bound to catch my eye either way, with Miles Morales being my favorite Spider-Man of all time. But God, what this movie did, not only for Sony Animations, but for animation in general, it made a definition and a humongous impact on the game. From the stunning visuals to the amazing plot points and enticing character cast who made me enjoy every second of this film. It was like watching one of my dreams come true on the big screen in front of my very eyes, and God, was it beautiful. So, main character, Miles Morales, a normal kid, gets bit by a spider when doing graffiti with his Uncle Ari. He sees Peter Parker die in front of his very own eyes as he was taught and trained into the role by Tobey Maguire, I mean Peter B. Parker. Now, he's to collaborate with spider people from other universes to fix the universe from being imploded by King Pin, who wants to see his dead wife and child. Now, introducing the cast of spiders, we have Spider Noir, Peter B. Parker, Spider Gwen, Spider Ham, and Penny Parker, then finally, Miles Morales. The crew of spiders have to infiltrate the lair and send everyone home. During the film, we see some of the best animation films that we haven't seen in a long time. With the immense creativity and great world building, you can feel like you're there with them. Miles starts off as a kid trying to just fill in the shoes of Spider-Man without any training wheels, so he's clumsy and filled with flaws, until he meets the second Peter Parker with a more or less background of Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. Now he's lazy and sort of a bum, but through trial and error, enjoying his time with Miles, he builds himself up again and is given his redemption arc in the storyline. 
While Gwen isn't talked too deeply in the film, you discover more on Across the Spider-Verse. She's given more of a mysterious aura befitting her title as the Ghost Spider. Spider-Ham, Spider-Noir, and Penny are briefly talked about, but are given an origin story and discussed pretty well in the film. One of my favorite scenes in the whole film has to be the Leap of Faith scene. It's even my outro because it demonstrates Miles Morales in his adventure till now and sums up the lesson that to get stuff in life, you yourself need to take a leap of faith into the great beyond because if you don't do something, who will? As all of the other spiders are sent back to the universe, it's up to Miles to fight Kingpin by himself in one of the most intense Spider-Man fights we have seen in a while. As they go back and forth throwing hands with each other, Miles seems like he might end up like the original Peter with the same death. Miles fights through the pain, standing up, refusing defeat. He beats Kingpin, webbing him up to the police with a perfect final scene, bringing the first film to a great conclusion. I'll always have my family. Going on to finally my top three films. Gotta go to some horror and hop off the superhero wagon real quick and go to the first Saw movie. Now, for modern horror, let me just say Saw was almost a stunning masterpiece adaption on the horror genre as a whole from the creativity, versatility, and adaptability of the stuff he used in the first film. Jigsaw was an extremely big nail biter that left me on the edge of my seat wondering what was going to happen next and whether or not it was survivable for the two survivors of the film. As Billy the Puppet, an iconic puppet of the franchise, which you'll see definitely more of in the future films of the series, explains to the captives, Adam, a rogue photographer on the go trying to get the next scoop and a little bit of a creep, and Lawrence Gordon, the doctor, trapped in the room, stuck in chains with a dead body in a pool of blood split in the middle of the room. They have to find a way out of some abandoned area of very limited and deadly supplies to keep them company in this eerie place. Now, this movie is a psychological. It really gets the brain thinking of ways to escape this hellhole, like if you were in that scenario, which is one of the best things you can have from a horror film, because it allows you to connect to the characters on a deeper level of relatability, which the first Saw film does really fucking well compared to most psychological horror films. The introduction of the characters and slowly learning their backgrounds in the film really adds on to the mystery of why, out of these two men, they were picked in this hellish death game, as they try to find a way out together with limited time to go before this place becomes their tomb. In desperation from a need to an escape, Dr. Lawrence Gordon cuts his foot off to escape, saying he would be back for Adam if he could make it. But little does Gordon know that will be the last time he will meet Adam alive again. As the body that was in the middle the whole time, we learn that it's the creator of this terrifying game, John Kramer. As he walks to the entrance, a horrified Adam can only stare, stuck as the final words he'll ever hear from another human will be. Ah! Game over! Intense, isn't it? Yeah, Saw is for sure one of those movies that keep you in a complete anticipation almost the whole way through, which is why I'm such a big fan of the original film and half the franchise. Coming from a storytelling aspect, the movie Saw is an elaborate process that makes me and some others love to enjoy analyzing the film. To see all the specific possibilities into the film, we get a deeper dive into why Adam and Gordon were put in the game, and easily, Gordon became the most interesting of the two. We find out that the doctor wasn't actually the best doctor, and was the one who gave John Kramer a wrong diagnosis, and because of that, he ends up suffering later down the line. So to make him understand what he did wrong, he must fight to survive this test, while Adam was just a stalker who would be taking photographs of people behind their backs for the longest time, obviously without them knowing. Finally, getting to our top two movies of my list. My number two pick for my favorite films has to be Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Now, when discussing Spider-Man films, this needs to be on the radar of the top three of films, because this film was a masterpiece for its time, and still is in my eyes. With the amazing rewatchability that the first film lacks, in this film, Peter, instead of trying to figure out the superhero life as much as trying to figure out the right mixture of balance between the roles of being Spider-Man and being Peter Parker. During his adventures of figuring out the balance, he must defeat his mentor turned supervillain Doc Ock, who is forced to become a villain due to his own machine, which forces him to do evil things he does in the film. In this film, you see Peter Parker's character more digressed as the stress of becoming Spider-Man becomes too much for Peter as we get the iconic scene of him throwing the suit in the trash with Spider-Man no more, and from now on, just a story of Peter Parker. But with good, he realizes how bad things have gotten without Spider-Man as Doc Ock continues building his machine to gain power of the sun in the palm of my hand. This leads to Mary Jane being kidnapped at a coffee shop in front of Peter's very own eyes. 
Oh, did I mention that Mary Jane is actually really good in this film compared to the other two? She's actually a reasonable and understandable character that's not bitchy just to be bitchy. Anyways, moving on, Peter fights Doc Ock in a sequence of destroying the whole surrounding area around him. In the process, Doc Ock ends up getting a somewhat redemption as he dies in the water, never to be seen again. Until No Way Home, of course. The movie ends happily with Peter realizing the world needs a Spider-Man. Without Spidey, he will end up saving the day. As Mary Jane says, go get him, Tiger, the film ends with him swinging off into the distance with an incredible sunset in the background. Now, this movie is really good, and in my opinion, better than the first because of the world building, character cast, plot, driving force, and more. Not to mention how many iconic scenes were made alone in the film, from the hot dog scene, to happiness that's up to greet me. To the jump scare Maguire scene. <laughs> to the go get him tiger scene. Go get him tiger. And of course, the most iconic scene, probably out of all the Raimi films, the train scene. Slower, gently. Is he alive? He's just a kid. No older than my son. It's all right. We found something. We won't tell nobody. Spider-Man. Showing how human Peter really is and how much of an impact that he has on this world compared to the adaptions of the other Spider-Mans, at least in a positive way. This movie is an emotional roller coaster that you never want to end as you really get to feel for the characters and see how their relationships in the film bounce off each other so well, with some of my favorite relationships in the film having to be Peter and Aunt May's interactions being some of the best scenes in the film for me, including their scene where they discuss Spider-Man's disappearance. May I say that I adore Aunt May in the Raimi trilogy? She has to be one of, if not the most underrated character in the whole franchise, seeing she plays the role perfectly, just like how Aunt May should be. Another relationship I enjoy is between Peter and Harry and how they're friends, that they could really like enjoy being around each other, but can also bump heads at certain points so nonchalantly as it's like nothing much. Spider-Man 2 was a perfect sequel, and in my humble opinion, better than the original. But there's only one movie I would put above it. Until I rewatch Across the Spider-Verse. And that movie has to be... Coraline. If you've seen my channel and subscribed for my popular Coraline videos, are you really that shocked? Coraline is the perfect film in my opinion, and has an amazing mixture of the stuff I enjoy most in films, which is suspense, action, a driving plot, character development, creativity, an interesting concept, and something a little creepy. Not to mention, I'm big on animation and animated films. Let's do a quick summary rundown for those who've never seen the film, and if you haven't, and choose to ignore what I'm gonna say, here you go. But please listen, go watch Coraline immediately. Yes, pause this video and go watch the film now. Yes, you viewer, right now. 
Anyways, the story of Coraline Jones is of a girl who is not given enough attention, and as most pre-teens to teens are, adventurous with no caution to the wind, as she explores the surroundings of the Pink Palace to find something interesting to do. In the meantime, as her parents stay busy doing work, she goes out and meets a kid named YB who she originally rejects, but eventually later in the film comes to accept as she is given a mysteriously blue-haired and yellow rain jacket doll that looks exactly like her by her new friend. The doll and some friendly mice lead her to a hole in the wall that leads to another world where everything is better. In fact, even better than the original world. Enjoying her time there, she eventually falls asleep and comes back to the reality of her boring, miserable life, waiting for the night to return so she can see her other parents, and she gets her wish at a cost. As the parents reveal the big bad secret that for her to continue to enjoy her time in this world, she must sew button eyes into where her eyes are. Like any sane child, she refuses and tries to escape, which through trial and error, meeting some dead kids, a version of white with no mouth, she does escape. But when she arrives back home, something is different. She can't find her original parents. This is where we discover after a sad scene of Coraline sleeping with makeshift fellows of her mom and dad that they've been trapped in the other world, and Coraline must go back to save them from her other mother. What she eventually, after gathering all the help and materials she could, goes back through where she has to go face to face with the other mother. Through convincing her to give her a chance, Coraline has to win her parents back through finding the eyes of the dead children she had met and where her parents were hidden, in the three wonders of the world that she was given. Through succession and barely succeeding, gets the eyes. She tricks the other mother to opening the door to the key that she just swallowed, where she grabs her parents who were in a snow globe all along, after throwing her bestie black cat at the other mother, which allows for her to escape, and a finale between the hand of the other mother and Coraline ensues. As real YB comes to save the day, everyone ends up at the Garden of the Pink Palace, growing stuff in the garden, sip and lean, and the story ends, or does it? And that's how Coraline the original film ends. Now, that's a ton of shit to unpack, but Coraline is perfect from its animation style to plot and creativity of how it's portrayed, its creepy undertone in a way to make it a legitimate film for almost all ages, with what happens go above and beyond, and try to rely on old patterns and instead of becoming original in its approach of the film. Coraline's story is provocative and increasingly interesting as it goes on, and that's why it's my favorite movie of all time, even if it's considered a kid's movie. And that's my top five movies of all time. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please subscribe and like the video. I know it's mad generic to say, but it seriously does help me. Alright, I love you guys. Stay safe out there, and make sure to eat your vegetables. Um, Cosmic signing off. That's all it is, Miles.